Hello and welcome to episode 71 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. Welcome back, chaps. Gary, you are organising OddCamp this year. It's official now. Yep, we announced it. I've sort of put my head on the block now and I have to deliver something. Yeah, quickly, when is it? OddCamp this year is on the 12th and 13th of October and it's at the Manchester Conference Centre in the Pendulum Hotel in Manchester. Right. And that got me thinking, what makes the perfect Linux event? To me, it involves the stuff around Linux events, the getting drunk, talking shit to people, maybe doing a live show. The hallway track, some might say. Some might say that, yeah. But for other people, I mean, Chris, you went to the Ubuntu Summit in Riga, and you got a lot out of the talks there, didn't you? Yeah, I think that's the balance, isn't it? You've got to cater for a little bit of everything so that people have the opportunity. I'd never been to an event like that before. And I think if I had my time again, I would have blended it up a bit more. I think I got too much into, there's a timetable of talks, I need to see something in each slot. And I would have been a bit more casual about it. But yeah, I mean, some of the talks I send to people now, because they come up a lot in conversation, like uh, Luca Weiss's talk about the Fairphone and There's so many touchstones in that where I talk about it to do with Android updates, to do with sustainability of manufacture and things like that. But I do think if it was too much that, then it would be too dry, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think for me, I made that same mistake pretty early on is going, I need a full timetable of talks. I need to put them in my calendar and I need to make sure I attend ones that are relevant to work, but also relevant to me as a person. And it became very stressful. And when I took a step back and thought, yeah, there's a bunch of talks I'd like to see, but there's also a bunch of people I'd like to talk to. I think I got a lot more value out of those events than I otherwise would have done. Interactivity is quite nice, but I feel like the best way to foster that is in the hallway track. So if you think about Wimpress and Popey, for example, they'll decide not to go to a talk, grab a drink, sit down, and suddenly Wimpress is doing something, and then people start gathering around, or even on the games night, which was kind of a social event, they decided to start looking at fixing something because that's what you do. But it wasn't too structured, so it was quite fun and everyone was peeking in and looking and going back. So I think it's fostering an atmosphere where that's allowed to happen is quite important, isn't it? Yeah, I think for me, just taking that time out to go, do you know what, I'm having a really interesting conversation. Let's just go and grab a beer or let's just go and grab a coffee and continue that conversation or whiteboard out and solve that problem is is a really important part of events that I don't think gets spoken about enough. And it's not really the event, right? It's just what happens when you put a load of really intelligent people in one place. Speak for yourself, Kerry. <laughs> That's why I like just going to the pub and having a laugh. I don't know. I remember demoing like Microsoft Azure to you in the Lassa Gare or something in Manchester at about 2 a.m. last time yeah. we were at Old Camp. So yeah, these things happen even there, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, you've flown over to Europe, Dalton, to conferences, to FOSDEM, for example. Yeah, my experience with conferences is either the largest open source conference in the world and the thing that has literally two rooms that we do a few talks in. (laughs) So (laughs) in both of those cases, the most fun I ever had at FOSDEM was not going to a talk but deciding, oh my god, there are way too many people here. Let's go into the cafe where it looks a little not so busy right now. We sat down at a table and we started getting all of the devices we had in our bags out. We ended up with like 10, 20 devices on the table and then people kept showing up. And by the end of it, we ended up with this huge collage of about 50 devices all running Ubuntu Touch on this table in the cafe. We called it our bootleg booth. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sorry. I might have contributed to crowding around you during that time. Did you? Well, I didn't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. I think it's one of the things where there is a nice balance, though, between having a really, really huge conference and something that's a little bit smaller and a bit more focused. Because Fosdem has all the talks and all the people and all of the tracks. And Linux Fest Northwest was somewhere in between when I flew over for that. It was, you know, there were tracks, there were people, there were booths, there was a good hallway track, but it was less busy. And then you get something smaller like OddCamp, where there is a track and there are a bunch of people who have something that they want to talk about because it's more of an unconference style. And 
people just vote for the talks they want to see. And sometimes there's not a talk in a room and that's okay. I feel like there's a real spectrum of those things that some people are going to enjoy the really big one more. Some people are going to enjoy the more chilled out community focused ones more. And I think there probably is at this point an open source FOSS conference for everyone. But you know what? When I first went to OddCamp, I think it was 2012, and I didn't know anyone. I had been listening to the Ubuntu podcast and Linux Outlaws, I think, and they kept going on about this thing, OddCamp, and it was only one train for me. It was pretty easy. So I went there on the Saturday, and I didn't know anyone. And it was a bit shit, to be honest, not knowing anyone and just feeling quite lonely. And believe it or not, I'm actually quite a shy person, you know. I'm not very outgoing. And I just didn't really have the confidence to talk to anyone because I didn't really know that much about Linux back then. And it was before I'd started doing this nonsense with you lot. And I'm not saying that it was anyone else's fault, but how do you, as an organizer of a conference, make it so that people in my situation can, you know, find the confidence to talk to someone? I think you do it by having talks that are talks that aren't necessarily just tech talks. So if I think about, I don't think it was the first old camp I went to, it might have been the second one. There was a talk that I can't remember the lady's name, but she did, that was about autism and how it had affected her and yeah, how she worked in tech. And it was probably the best conference talk I've ever been to at Linux conference. And everyone came out of that room with something in common that they realized that there were maybe things that they could do to help people or there were traits that they recognized in themselves. And I feel like sometimes we focus on the thing that brings us all together there is FOSS. But actually, maybe the thing that brings us together there isn't FOSS, and it's just wanting a sense of belonging. And I think if you can try and capture that in some way, then that goes a really long way to helping it. Well, when I used to do FOSS Talk Live, at the beginning, I would do my intro and I do various bits, taking the piss out of uh, the likes of Stuart and whatnot on stage. And then as part of it, I would say to people, in the breaks between the shows, if you're here on your own, stay down here and just try and talk to people. And I think it worked. I don't know. I, th I think it did. It's hard for me to say because I knew everyone at that point. But sort of just saying to people, there are other people here like you that are on their own, they don't know anyone. So, you know, try and strike up a conversation. I think, uh, well, I like to think that that was a valuable thing to say. Yeah, I think there's two things there. So there is one that you should encourage your speakers to be saying that and prevent them from being double booked on talks or anything so that they won't have somewhere to be right after their talk mm. so that they can be in the hallway and have people come up to them and start conversations. And that's how you'll kind of get those breakout things. <laughs> forming around them. But also, I think that, not to toot our own horn too much here or anything, but I think that having people like us at events like that, where people know our voices or our faces, depending on what type of media we are, and have the parasocial relationship with us, can actually make them more comfortable to just come up and strike up a conversation from time to time. Uh, and I think that's important too, is just having people with medium notoriety <laughs> around. Well, yeah. I went and spoke to Dan and Fab. They were the first people I spoke to because they were doing a podcast and I sort of had this parasocial relationship with them and that sort of broke the ice. Well, I had the opposite experience to that, actually, where I'd obviously been listening to the Ubuntu podcast and your shows and everything else for a really long time. And actually, my first thought when I heard, like, Wimpy's voice, for example, was, oh, that's Wimpy. I can't go and talk to him. He's a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, he's a celebrity, right? And it wasn't until I ended up ordering a beer at the same time as him at the bar, and he was like, oh, I'll get that. And we struck up a conversation and ended up talking until stupid o'clock in the morning that I really realized that tech celebrities, for want of a better term, like people <laughs> like us, like we're just people, and that it's okay to walk up to someone that you don't recognize, but that you know their voice and have a conversation with them. Yeah, if they're at an event like that, then yeah, if, if I'm at an event like that, then I want people to come and talk to me and, you know, talk about something cool and interesting. Yeah, well, I can guarantee you when I was at FOSDEM this year and I was on my own, 
<laughs> I absolutely would have loved someone to come up and start a conversation with me because I just spent half of the time sitting in the cafe drinking coffee and watching talks on my laptop. Because it was too busy to get into the rooms. Uh, yeah, well, that was also because I couldn't get into the rooms. But my point stands, right, that you go to these things on your own, it can be a lonely place. Just talk to people. I think what you said, Dalton, is really important. It's what I would call recovery. There needs to be recovery time built in for the spontaneous acts to happen. And in our in our context, I think one of the best things that can happen is someone starts doing something that looks vaguely interesting on a techie thing. That tends to draw people over, especially if it starts with more than one person. Is that a table full of phones with the same default wallpaper? Exactly. <laughs> or for Riga, is that running Ubuntu Core? People wanted to break it. People wanted to see what was happening. People wanted to to get hands on. So I think it's it's really important, as I say, I think you need to allow it to happen. That's one of the things is to relax and trust that if the atmosphere is correct, then people won't feel so rabbit in the headlights. And I think from what I've seen of Fostem, it looks really, really busy. And I'm sure that's great in some ways, but mm. if you were that person, Joe, going to your first ever conference completely on your own, that would be quite difficult, I think. Fosdem was almost way too overwhelming for me the last time I went. I can't imagine what it's like now that everyone's on the bounce back track. There's no way that's going well anymore. Yeah, like I, I'm a relatively outgoing person, and I like going to conferences, and I like socializing, but it was too much for me. That's for sure. And we're not here to just rag on Fosdem, of course. It's a spectrum, isn't it? You're looking for a broad range of events that you can attend. And I think it's, it's okay that some of them are larger and some of them are smaller. As long as you have correct expectations, I think. So that comes down to partly publicity. What type of event is this? If you've got previous footage, like honestly, a reel of what the event is like is actually really useful because you can see what type of thing is happening, you know, what's the format of the talks or watching recorded talks. Because I watched a lot of the previous year's Ubuntu Summit talks to get a flavor of that. So not feeling like it's something you completely don't know what's going to happen can be quite useful as well. Yeah, and I think recording talks is one of those things that is really difficult when you're a smaller conference. Like the requirements to set up cameras and live streaming kit and all the rest of it is really big. So... It's very much a nice to have, I think. But like you say, there are big benefits to it. Yeah, there's a reason I always take my own recording gear if we're going to do a live show at a conference. Mm -hmm. Even just like those time lapses of people coming in and leaving the building can be, mm. oh, so that's how many people are there. Yeah. Kind of information. Okay, this episode is sponsored by people who support us with PayPal and Patreon. Go to linuxafterdark.net slash support for details of how you can support us too. Patreon supporters have the option to listen to episodes without ads like this. And it's not just this show. There's Late Night Linux for news, discoveries, audience input, and misanthropy. Two and a half admins about system administration. Linux Matters for upbeat, family-friendly adventures. Linux Dev Time about developing with and for Linux. Hybrid Cloud Show for everything private and public cloud. And Ask the Hosts for off-topic questions from you. You can even get some episodes a bit early. We've got a lot going on. And it's only possible because of the people who support us. So if you like what we do and can afford it, it would be great if you could support us too. At linuxafterdark.net slash support. Let's do some feedback then. Freezer asks, do you still create multiple partitions on your Linux installations, such as root, home, and swap? I stopped doing so many years ago. I install everything on one partition and I use a swap file for swapping. That's pretty much what I do, except I tend to use ZRAM these days but yeah i don't partition it up on my machines no i install base fedora or silver blue or whatever i'm using now and i leave it yep i do exactly the same as dalton whatever fedora suggests in the installer and then i tick the box to encrypt the disk and that's all i care about there are a few cases where i do something a little bit custom if it's like a server with many arrays in and things but for my laptop whatever the installer suggests i do I think once or twice I had separate root and home, for example, and then I ran out of space on my root partition and shrinking and moving to the right 
is a pain and a real pain once you start to involve encryption, as you say, like looks. And I've I've done it. I've done it both ways. I've shrunk and grown a looks partition. And KDO Partition Manager makes it trivial to expand, but it's harder to shrink. But I just can't be doing with that. I'd rather take some kind of snapshot of all my files and then just reinstall if I get into bother. Yeah, I similarly have messed around with separate home partitions on different SSDs and stuff like that. But ultimately, I've just found it easy to just have one big root partition and just back stuff up and not worry about it. Yeah, I mean, my laptop has a one terabyte SSD. Why do I need to split it up? <laughs> I mean, I think with Silverblue and if you look under the hood, there are ButterFS sub volumes going on. And obviously, you've got your OS tree workflow, so you can yoink the root and Home is separate but built in. But again, it's not something that we're going into the manual partitioning screen for and going, I want this much for this, this much for that. I want to separate these out. It is what it does. And we're just going with the, with the flow. In my main desktop computer, though, I do have an extra two terabyte SATA drive that my friend gave me. Quite a nice Samsung 860. And um, I put my downloads in that and other just crap but I just have Firefox configured to download to that directory. So it's not in my home directory. I could probably symlink it, I suppose. But uh, I do find myself dumping crap on that SSD. I followed that approach before when SSDs weren't as cheap. So I'd have the operating system root partition on an SSD and then some spinning rust. And then they would both be encrypted and I'd use a key file to chain load the decryption. So I put my looks passphrase in for the root SSD and in the root partition of the root SSD would be a key file that would chain load, decrypt the Rust. And then the Rust would have sim links for downloads and various other things, I think music, pictures, into my home directory. And then of course, snaps came along and things wouldn't open then because <laughs> I didn't like it at first and stuff like that. But again, as Gary said, SSDs now are so cheap. I just, apart from for large arrays of enormous storage, I'm going to be getting a large SSD and probably a single one for everything in a laptop, certainly. Yeah, manual partitioning wasn't something that we wanted to do. It was just something that we had to do. And we don't have to do it anymore, so we don't. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. And I've been Dalton. See you later. <laughs>